Hey everyone, my name is Johnny Dovercourt. I'm a writer, musician, and concert presenter based here in Toronto. I'm the co-founder and artistic director of the Wavelength Music Series. And last year, basically exactly a year ago, March of 2020, I published my first book, which is entitled Any Night of the Week, A DIY History of Toronto Music, 1957 to, to, to 2001. And so I'm really pleased to be here to talk about the book on Welcome to the Music. Hi, the following podcast is brought to you by Radical Road Brewery, the best craft beer in the heart of Leslieville. Find them at 1177 Queen Street East. That's Radical Road Brewery. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. It's great to be here. I have to ask you about your name. Yes. Where, where did, and, and I'm sure you've, you might have, you know, answered this question a thousand times. <laughs> um, but Never get uh, old. Yeah. How, how did you, where did the, where did the name come from? Well, my, my, my real name is Jonathan Bunce. Nothing wrong with that name. Totally solid name, but it's just a little not that rock and roll. And I always sort of <laughs> imagine having a, 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 like a more of a stage name and um, like a punk name. And um, so I used to ha- I used to live on Dovercourt Road, which, uh, as everyone knows, is a lovely northwest, sorry, north south street in the west end of Toronto. And I used to live up at uh, Bloor and Dovercourt. Um, you know, back when it was still kind of a bit of a distant part of the city, when it was still kind of when most people that I knew in the music scene were either living like in the Annex or Kensington Market or Queen Street, you know, there wasn't really much going on at Bloor Court. It was like I just lived up there because it was cheap and had this crazy place that was like a two floor apartment that was eight hundred dollars a month. You know, that was like shared, right? Shared with a roommate. Home. 400 bucks a month in the late nineties. And even for the time it was a steal and, and no one lived downstairs and the landlord used the main floor as storage and the house was detached. So we had some rager parties at this place and I recorded tons of bunch of albums there, like band, we, we could set up and drums and do like home recordings. They like full band home recordings there. It was a great place. I lived there for seven years, you know, it was a great place. And um, I was dating this dating this girl at the time, <clears throat> and so the story is, she uh, she was working at a place in Scarborough, which is ironically where I'm from, and you know, but living downtown, she lived down the street. Her coworker lived up the street, also on Dovercourt, and so I ran into her coworker on the way to the subway when I was going to work at my day job, then I Weekly, where I was doing the concert listings at the time. So um, my the friend got to work, saw my girlfriend and said, oh, Johnny Dovercourt sighting this morning. She <laughs> ran and, and, and this girlfriend was the first person, one of the first people to start calling me Johnny as well. So she started calling me Johnny. And then, uh, so I credit this uh, lovely ex of mine as being the person who sort of brought the Johnny Dovercourt character to life. And then at first it was a, I use it as a as a byline and as a, a fake columnist at iWeekly. We had a lot of fun yeah. back then. We did a lot of silly stuff. I think I actually wrote about the Spice Girls for the first time that Johnny Dovercourt <laughs> alias okay. appeared, like or reviewed this. I can't remember exactly, but reviewed the Spice World sequel or something like that, you know. And uh, and then when we started Wavelength, uh, that was sort of the pen name that I used in the Wavelength zine, and that sort of became more like my Wavelength alias and. That's how everyone in the music scene knows me. And, you know, it's kind of like just having a rap name. Yeah. You know, like you're a punk name. So For sure. Everyone calls Chris Jericho, Chris Jericho. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. And that, it might now be his legal name, but um, yeah. I think it was Irvine or something, his last name. Yeah. And everyone has it. And most a lot of people in the music scene have more, more humble birth names. So. Sure. Bono, The Edge. Yeah, Iggy yeah. Pop, J- aka James Osterberg. Yeah, exactly. David Jones, David Bowie. <laughs> uh, what's Alice Cooper's real name? Like Vincent Fursterberg or something like that. Yeah, or Gene Simmons to- had some very, you know, a very square name. Something like, to be said for rock and roll names. Yeah, right. It's about re- self reinvention. So I don't know. Sure. I just always, you know, felt when I when I sort of discovered that name, I felt like it felt like the 
more relaxed person I'd always wanted to be. Yeah. More relaxed version of myself. So I'm a current Scarborough resident. Oh, nice. Where? Yeah. Where about? Uh, well, currently, I'm near Parkway Mall. So a hop, skip, and a oh. jump away from where Maestro Fresh West oh, nice. uh, was inspired to write uh, Let Your Backbone Slide. From Birchmount, uh, just north of Glendower? That's where you're from? Well, that's no, that, I, that, I just know that from a Maestro song from Conductive. Oh, okay, okay. One of the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, what, part, what, what part of Scarborough were you uh, brought up in? I'm from West Hill, so around, uh, so further east of there, ironically, like around Morningside and Kingston. Okay. And a high school at Woburn Collegiate, which was the Bare Naked Ladies High School. Oh. Yeah, like the, so actually it might have seen one of their, like one of their earliest gigs at a spirit assembly at our high school. Because they were finishing high school around the time that I was starting. Like I was no in, grade, way. in grade nine when they were starting out and they were in grade 12, 13. There or used to be like this Page and Robertson, that is. Yeah. There used to be this um this Scarborough music camp. Uh mm-hmm. I, and I can't remember if it was on the Manitoulin or or where it was, but um I, I think those two were camp counselors. That sounds uh, right. Yeah. That sounds yeah. that sounds that sounds right. Yeah, it was definitely very they were very much products of the music like education system. Yeah, yeah, and, and my sister remembers being. Uh, I think she played the bass. Uh, she put out a couple of independent CDs, um, but she remembers being at one of these camps, uh, and uh, they would just say, you know, just say any any word, um, and we'll make a song out of it, and and, and that's how they. Uh, that's how they would entertain. And then years go by and one of the music teachers is getting married. And my sister and Jim Cregan, who's the bass player, uh, end up singing at, uh, at this uh, music teacher's uh, wedding. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not to, and and there's more to this uh, bare naked ladies story and how I'm connected to them. Uh, about eight years ago, I want to say, no, maybe five or eight years ago, uh, my wife starts a new job and she's talking with, uh, uh, I think the, one of the directors of, of this, a uh, non-for-profit organization, uh, called park people. Oh yeah. Okay. And, um, and you know, they're, they're, they're just talking, getting to know each other. Uh, oh, you're married. What does your husband do? Oh, he's in advertising and, what does your husband do? Oh, he's he's in this band, uh, Bare Naked Ladies. Have you heard of them? <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> who's who's your who's your husband? Jim. He's 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 the bass player, you know. So, um, yeah. So that was that, that was a funny story my wife told me. And yeah, and it, I mean, ever think everyone has Bare Naked Ladies connections in Toronto? Because Jim Jim lived like at the end of the block of where my last apartment, uh, uh, over by Trinity Bellwoods, and yeah. Both- and both my sister and my current girlfriend went to her front current partner, went to high school with the Cregan brothers at Moet Collegiate in Scarborough. It is crazy. Yeah. It is crazy. But um, yeah, I, I didn't bump into him this weekend, but I saw him at Trinity Bellwoods uh, over the weekend walk, walking his dog. Yeah. Um, as we were just, you know, out uh, grabbing some, some rays uh, in Toronto, as, but. Um, yeah. As was half the city, it sounds like. It was packed. Like I'm, I'm like I still live in Scarborough, but we went down there to drop off something, and so my wife said, "Hey, let's go take a walk in Bellwoods," um, and I was shocked at how many people were mm-hmm. in there. I'm really not too happy about the way people are acting. Like it's it's not over. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's it was a weird feeling mm-hmm. um, being there. Um, but anyways, it's it is what it is, and you know, hopefully things will. We'll get better and, and we can go see some live music. Yeah. Well, it only will if people uh, still keep complying and, you know, until they get their vaccinations. Yeah. We're still, you know, we're, we're not out of this yet. True. Do you remember the last live show you saw before, uh, I guess, before a year ago? Yes. It's actually kind of, it's actually kind of neat, kind of poetic because uh, the last show I went to was... March 6th, 
2020 at a place called Duggan's Brewery, a little basement venue in Parkdale, underneath uh, in the basement of this uh, microbrewer, like craft brewery. And it was with uh, two of the band. There's three bit three bands. I forget who the third band was, but the other two were A Way Forward, who were celebrating their release of their new album and a solo project uh, called Words Last. And Words Last is was the new solo project of my oldest friend Dave Rogers, the guy I started playing music with like yeah. thirty odd years ago in high school. And A Way Forward is the new band with members of Mean Red Spiders and Neck, the two bands that played the very first Wavelength show 20, 21 years ago. And this wow. was just only a few years, a few weeks after we just celebrated, Wavelength had just celebrated our 20th anniversary. So, you know, these are like some, all, you know, some of my oldest friends and the person that I started playing music with that kind of got me into this whole life you know, so it was very, it was very, I had obviously had no idea at the time, but that was sort of a kind of poetic way to say goodbye to live music. Hopefully not forever. Yeah. And, and I guess, you know, March 6th, there was no, like no one was thinking like, is this going to end anytime soon? It was just right on the cusp of it. Cause I remember, you know, I remember that those first two weeks pretty clearly. Cause it was right at the same time I was just picking up my book. Yeah. Mm, my, um, because my uh, book launch party was supposed to be March 24th, which is a year oh. ago tomorrow from when we're speaking. And um, so I remember that week, it was just, I remember earlier that, like that same week, maybe a few days earlier, I went to some like industry networking event and everyone was still kind of doing the, still kind of joking about it, being like, oh, can we high five? Can we shake hands? Are we, you know, like, don't get too close to me. Do you have COVID? Ha ha. Like it was sort of at that yeah. sort of point where um, it was, that was like one of the last sort of in-person kind of networking things, I, industry events I went to. Not that I go to a lot of them, but um that was I recall there being it was at that point where it was just starting to become a thing, but it was the following week that suddenly that was it was declared the you know the the World Health Organization or the WHO World, World Health Organization declared a global pandemic and the, the the schools were closed. They announced this, they were closing the schools the same day. I went to Coach House Books to pick up my first copies of the book. Wow. And then we had to sit down at the big table at the coach house office and say, okay, looks like we're going to be postponing the launch party, but hopefully we can reschedule it within like six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> My How goodness. naive we were, you know? Yeah, for sure. Oh, that is crazy. Yeah. Um, I remember going to, uh, I went to see the beaches at the, da at the, um, at Danforth music hall. Mm hmm. Uh, great show, but I remember that that evening because there was already talk, and I, it was maybe a week before the lockdown. Uh, there had already been talk of, you know, crowds, and you know, there was there were small cancellations. It was sort of, you know, going through Asia, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we're in Toronto, and we think we're like we're we're worlds away from any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of in the back of my mind as as I'm enjoying the show. Um, and then Greg and I, we hosted a, um, a producer who played some music at, um, at a radical road, uh, literally less than a week before shut down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was a joke about, ah, don't worry about it. I'll, you know, we'll give you a hug anyway, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, you don't think of it. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, March 12th, 13th, 14th, it's like, stay at home. Yeah. March break is going to be three weeks. Let's figure this thing out. And and we're still working from home, you know, yeah. a year later. I mean, you know, it's like unthinkable at the time that there that like that if you if you if we'd said to ourselves a year ago, this you know your life is going to be completely fundamentally altered and changed for the next year, and you're not mm -hmm. going to go out to a live concert or a movie theater or you know mm -hmm. or um, hug your loved ones, and you're like that's you know. Uh, people would just would have thought you were crazy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So. I don't know if you saw any of the, uh, the videos that were shared on social this past week, but crowded house played a show. I want to say in New Zealand. That's where they're from. So that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, when I saw it, I'm thinking, 
what this is this from now or is this like a year or two ago where is it and but it was like live people are have started going to shows yeah um, new zealand's back australia's back i even saw i haven't seen any any footage or anything but yeah i i even saw like an american band announcing an australia some australian dates yeah cuz they seem to have figured it out there you know like yeah. hard lockdown yeah let's get rid of it yeah and and let's control it none of this nonsense that you know europe or north america is trying to you know balance uh you know keeping things open and keeping things safe it's yeah it, they've they've, they've sort of figured it out yeah um, we could learn the lesson from that from from the from the aussies and kiwis for sure yeah Tell me about the start of Wavelength Music. Uh, oh. What was the genesis of that? So Wavelength started, um, you know, back in the, the, the genesis of it was in the late 90s. You know, I mean, in the, throughout the, I started playing in, you know, bands that were active in the in Toronto in the early 90s when I was still, you know, still in high school or starting university. And um, in the 90s, it was, Toronto was a very different, the music scene was very different. Like the, it was actually really great in a lot of ways. In hindsight, there was tons of venues. There was really good media. You know, there was there was Now Magazine. There was iWeekly. There was Exclaim. There was radio station. You know, three campus radio stations: CKLN, CIUT, CHRY. Um, and there was tons of bands, but it was still really hard to break out of Toronto. There was no, there weren't a lot of kind of success stories at an indie level. You know, you had people who would sort of like the Rio Statics or Change of Heart who had been at it for a while, who kind of had broken to maybe kind of like a national level of, of acclaim. But even the bands like that, they still had to gig a lot, gig all the time. And um, like it was especially sort of breaking out of Canada was really hard. And um, it seemed like there was, uh, there was almost like a sort of a force field around the city for indie bands. And the, um, there wasn't a lot of support for the local music scene that there, all the, all the major labels are based here, but they really just weren't kind of not interested in taking it, a risk on anything that wasn't already commercial or already kind of a proven commodity uh, and kind of, you know, chasing trends in a kind of, you know, mm -hmm. follower sort of way. Um, so I think the idea with Wavelength was a bunch of us who are all in bands have just been doing this for a few years and we're kind of frustrated with this sort of like hamster wheel of, you know, um, you know, starting a band, you know, uh, making a demo, getting some gigs, bu building up a following, saving up your money to put out an album, you know, CD, and then um, hope, you know, uh, hopefully getting some press in now or I and then but then the next step was just like not obvious, you know, it was really the next step of touring or reaching a bigger audience just seemed inaccessible. So, and there were just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of local support unless for, you know, unless you were already at that kind of level of, of, uh, of, of a claim. So it was, it was a really challenging place for, for local bands to kind of get to that next rung. So the idea with Wavelength was to start something that was really all about expressly about supporting the local music scene and doing it from a kind of artist, artist centered, artist run perspective, like not doing it from a, ooh, like music industry talent discovery kind of um, let's break the next big band kind of um, approach. It was really mm -hmm. sort of more about just like the championing good music for good music's sake. And 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 finding a like a more of authentic grassroots place for artists to network. So um, and so I, so we started a we started a weekly music series that was curated, and that was also really different because um, you know there were new band nights. There was all the things that had been going on for a while, like Elvis Monday, which had gone yeah. around from venue to venue. And at that point, it was at that Elma Combo, and uh, and then uh, and there was also um, the new music Tuesdays at the horseshoe, uh, which, you know, Dave, our Dave Bookman, rest in peace, Dave Bookman ran that night. And, you know, those were great nights, but they were, uh, it, it there wasn't a kind of, it was just kind of the, the bills, the bills were random, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't like a cure sense of curation with wavelength. It was very much like, let's like put, let's think about the bat, the acts we put together. Let's curate an interesting experience. Let's bring in interesting visuals. Let's have, performance art and poetry and we had people from the music scene DJing between sets like which was really different so it was almost like more like an arts this kind of arts artistic experience right and it was also all about accessibility the nights were paid
And we also did a zine. Like we, we interviewed, this is you know, pre-social media, like in the early days of Wavelength, the only um, like source of promotion that we really did was was putting up the zine where we we uh, we had the schedule for for each month and we interviewed the bands that were playing each night and we even had you know it, the, the zine really kind of took on a life of its own that we had columnists we had we even had a record review section for a while we had, we had comics this whole sort of subcultural experience and you know we didn't back then we didn't need to buy ads we didn't even really need to do street postering and we put we we put the zine at soundscapes and rotate this and around the cafes where people would hang out and people would pick up the zine and it kind of gave the the wavelength night this kind of like aura of being bigger than it was nice but even though it was just put together by a bunch of musicians with really no budget just you know doing it out of out of love and out of pa as a sort of a real passion project and it grew from there and 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 it kept sort of like you know uh grew from year to year. And then we got to the point where we were able to incorporate uh, as an, as a nonprofit and start to get funding to government, you know, government funding, public funding to support what we were doing. And now it's 21 years later, which is really hard to believe. 21 years. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, about the book. Yeah. What was the, I mean, it is a, it is a, it's, it's not a long book, but it's so dense. Like there's so much in it. It's, you know, three with acknowledgements is 317 pages. Um, it covers, I think it, because it covers basically a half a century. Almost. Of, of music in Toronto uh, from 57 to 2001. Um, but what was the, what was the idea of, of writing this book? Was there, was there something missing that you, that you needed to get everything written down in one spot or, or what was it? Yeah. I just felt, I've always felt like there's been a problem of documentation in the Toronto music scene and um, like just like a general lack of knowledge of, uh, of what's happened here. And it's, it's almost like the Toronto, the history of the Toronto, of the Toronto music scene was like an urban legend, you know, okay, people, yeah. you know, it's like people knew little bits bits and pieces but um and and it's something that i'd always kept tabs on and it's actually even going back to the start of wavelength it's one of the things that we wanted to do even at the start of wavelength was like oh we need to document the history better because pe people don't know about all these amazing bands that have come out of here and even just myself like just thinking about myself as someone who's deeply involved in the scene you know i only you know i knew about you know, a bit about Fifth Column and you know, just thinking about the bands that were important to me, like kind of underground heroes, like Fifth Column or Shadowy Men and the Shadowy Planet, just to pick two names. Like those, I'll, I'll, I pick, I'll pick those two names because they were the kind of examples of the sort of the few kind of local Toronto indie bands that were actually able to break out of Toronto and get some acclaim in the rest of the world. Um, but even those acts are still kind of, often, you know, usually left out of the history books. Um, and there, there aren't really many sort of history books about Toronto. Um, I guess it was just sort of like, I, I, you, you had to kind of pick up bits of, just pick up knowledge from, from, from here and there, from, from reading magazines. And, you know, there's no kind of real docu, no one's ever really done a documentary about, about Toronto music. Um, but starting in 2009, there started to be a bit more formal documentation. Um, there is, like, people started to release books, but sort of publish books about the punk scene. Although in 2009, and that's really kind of got what got my brain starting, starting to, the wheels in my brain starting to turn like, oh, it could, maybe I could write my own book, was, um, you know, Liz Worth wrote this amazing history of Toronto punk in 2009. And that like really opened my eyes because I knew about, I knew of bands like the Diodes and the Vile Tones. Like I knew some of their songs and I knew just like little snippets. Like I knew the Vile Tones, um, you know, had released this amazing song called Screaming Fist and that Steve Leckie was AKA Nazi dog, you know, cut himself up on stage. And, but that's like about all I knew, you know, and I knew that the, the Diodes had written some great pop songs and that they ran their own, you know, their own space called Crash and Burn and that it was one of the first DIY venues in Toronto. But that's about all I knew either. It's just like just little fragments of information. So part of me, I just wanted to know this stuff for myself and I wanted to 
to sort of actually try and document Toronto history. And, and I knew, and, you know, I just knew little, little bits here and there. I knew that, um, I knew that there was this, had been this great psychedelic scene in the Yorkville in the sixties. Um, and that, you know, I knew that Neil Young and your Joni Mitchell came out of it, but that's about all I knew. I only knew the basics. So I kind of wanted to learn more and go beyond this kind of like really, you know, just point form kind of summary of Toronto music and really kind of dive into like, Oh, what was, what was it like? What was actually happening? Who were the, who were the bands that were, um, building this scene and who were the people that were supporting it and how, and, and kind of link all these different eras together to try and basically sort of, I wanted to tell a kind of story of the city itself, like story, how did the city become the, what's the sort of autobiography, the biography of Toronto as a city was sort of tell it through music. And it, it, it became originally it was going to be sort of going up to closer to the present day. And that became too much of a, of a, just a big job. And that's why like the book took, took me four years to write and wow. we had to, I had to basically cut it in half. And that's why it ends at 2001 because just the, the last 20 years, so much happened post to like post 2000 in the 21st century. So much, so much more happened in terms of just the volume of artists that have come out of here mm-hmm. since, you know, at least like since the days when we started wavelength that that would could take up a whole, like a second, second volume. Yeah, so, if not so multiple still, volumes on its own. Yeah, maybe. So, and then, you know, I had to kind of narrow things down a bit by genre, you know, like I couldn't, you know, I had to leave out classical and jazz for the most part and and mm-hmm. and metal and and there's and, yeah. and only kind of barely touched on world music and touched a little bit, of, you know, touched a little bit on jazz, but more the kind of uh, avant-garde stuff that's more to my taste and interest. Um, and even kind of mainstream rock, I kind of really didn't really dive into that much because, you know, I really kind of focused on my own and int- like had to had to sort of frame things a bit on my own interest in terms of uh, more like indie alternative rock and reggae and hip hop and electronic music and sort of what I think is think of as being the sort of more progressive vanguard end of so so called popular music. Yeah, well, again, it's in the title, right? It's a DIY history it's not uh it's not the history of pop yeah that's the thing like that's the like the i'm glad you picked up on that because the diy some people were like what do you mean by a diy history i don't know what that means and uh and i think well to me i felt it was pretty obvious like it's 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 my history it's i wrote i wrote a diy history i wrote my own history of uh, my own take on the history of the of music in the city yeah, yeah. Whether a band breaks or not, as long as it's, um, as long as a band sort of did it their own way, sort of were scrappy, didn't play by the rules, um, you know, and, and weren't sort of a, a, a dis, you know, there's no discovery on YouTube story that made it huge. It's it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's bands that are making their own venues, make their own costumes, make their own CD covers and, and, and all exactly. that sort of stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I totally, you totally get it. You know, they, they did it for, they'd made music for its own sake because they wanted yeah. to, and they were driven to, and if, you know, whether or not they made it to that next level of success, does not, you know, that's not the, that's not the, the sort of um, quality in which I was judging their worth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it could have also been a music venue book. Yeah. Because you talk about just a ton, uh, a ton of venues, sort of in passing. Yeah. Um, but you must have learned a ton. I guess also as a um, as a DIY musician yourself. Uh, but you must have seen a ton of these venues mm-hmm. come and go in your time as well. Well, yeah, that's what was you know the the book went it went through a lot of evolutions when I was going with like the start the format and structure went through a few evolutions when I was working on it with my editor and got you know worked in a co- with a couple of different editors on this and God bless them all and their patience <laughs> um, you know over the four years that we uh, that it took to write this and you know it was like finding that sort of framework to tell the story through was a bit of a challenge and. Um, And that's why there's kind of like two halves of the book. There's the artist half, like the profiles. And then there's kind of this chronological narrative, which is told through the venues. 
um, because that was the one thing that really um, I discovered through writing this was the importance of these spaces of of the music venues mm-hmm. and how you know they they became the kind of nexuses for different chapters of the scene, different eras of the music scene. You know, um, like the the '60s Yorkville psychedelic folk scene was based, you know, it was all sort of centered around this cluster of coffee houses in this sort of two or three block radius of Yorkville. And the, you know, like the punk and new wave scene uh, and sort of early alternative music scene was really, was centered around this sort of strip of clubs along Queen West. And, uh, and then even the kind of, the kind of um, the 90s scene, that I was a part of the kind of indie experimental electronic scene that, that Wavelength came out of was really based around these sort of scuzzy clubs in the College Street Kensington area, like Sneaky D's and the Alma Combo. Yeah. So, um, so that's the physical space really became important. And, and that's also because um, for, for Toronto, the venues were really the thing that were sort of the most stable and the most reliable at least for small bands, like you could always, uh, you could always get booked somewhere. You could, but you couldn't necessarily find someone to help you put out your records. Like there is never until the two thousand. I sort of make this point in the book. And until the two thousands, there really wasn't wasn't uh, there weren't many local record label, local indie labels that were yeah. that were sort of you know capturing the Toronto, the sort of spirit of the Toronto, local Toronto music scene and broadcasting it to the rest of the world. The way that there were in other, other secondary cities that, had, that did have success that way, the way, you know, sub pop records did was putting Seattle on the map or factory records did putting Manchester on the map. You know, these, those are American and British cities that were, you know, not the major cities, not New York mm-hmm. or London, you know, or LA. And they like re- those those labels really kind of like without realizing it kind of marketed those cities as a, as a music musical brand, but no one had really done that with Toronto until I think you know until sort of arts and crafts came along in two thousand, yeah. um, and sort of and Drake Drake did sort of same thing with OVO Sound in the hip hop world, arts and crafts did it in the indie world. Um, but it was the, it was the, it was the clubs. It was the Elmo, it was places like the Horseshoe and the Elmo and even the bigger places like Massey Hall that were really kind of, that really kind of captured the identity of the city's music. Yeah. It's, as you, as you were talking, it sort of fell in my head. There's, um, Elma Combo recently started, unless it's been around for a little while their own record label am i am i correct mm-hmm. i think i think kim uh, kim mitchell just like his latest album is out of elma combo records i hadn't heard that but i'm not surprised i mean the new owner has put a lot of money into the renovation and making it you know like the state of the art recording studio and live streaming facility so yeah. i wouldn't be surprised if they have also started a label yeah i'm sort of there's also i picked up this record Oken, uh, they're a, uh, a Toronto based Cuban duo. I picked cool. this up at, um, I think it is on, I want to say it's Blur West. There's a club on there that this record, um, oh man, and I can't, it's not a, uh, it's not on you, Lula, Lula Lounge. They've got the Lula World Records. Um, wow. And you know, what's funny is that I, I, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that Lula had their own label, but I'm not surprised, you know, that's, and the Cameron house, the, the current owners of the Cameron house, they have their own label too. I mean, those guys, it's the, it's the kids of the first generation of the owners, yeah. um, the Ferreros, Ferrero, Ferrero brothers are the, the, the sons of Amory, um, the, uh, who is one of the original owners. And yeah, like it makes sense. Like, you know, venues become kind of community hubs, right? For yeah. parts of the scene, like a place where people gather, where where artists meet each other, where, you know, f- music lovers, you know, make friends over a pint of beer. And like, why not, um, you know, take it to the next step and start, you know, start start supporting the music in that way by putting out records for people. It's, it's you know, it's, and I think that the music industry, especially because like everyone's had to, to diversify in the music industry because, 
that in, income streams have been so cut off in so many ways, even, you know, pre, pre-COVID, you know, and the, the, uh, the record industry, especially, you know, it's just it's really had a really hard time in the last 20 years. So that's true. Why not? I remember seeing uh, Shad perform at, I think it's the Great Hall. Um, but I've always been curious where, like, where do these startup hip hop rap groups, rappers, like, where do they go? Uh, is, is there a concert venue? Is there a venue that is predominantly this is where you go to uh, discover um, hip hop in Toronto? I'd say no. I think that because the rap music game is just really it's just not like the rock game. It's not as focused on the kind of live the live performance ladder the same way. You know, like hip hop music is studio music. You know, it's all about. Make you know, hanging out in the studio, and making tracks, and people guessing on each other's on each other's uh, recordings, and the um, I think the like the live show for most rappers is a few steps down the road. You know, like they kind of they they you know, it's all about kind of getting tracks up on SoundCloud or you know, getting you know, getting getting your songs out on Spotify and or getting onto playlists, and then. And then thinking about live shows um, a bit further down the road, but there's also, there hasn't really been, and I think it's been kind of a crime that there hasn't been a dedicated hip hop venue in Toronto. I think they kind of have to link up, up and coming rappers have to link up with sort of certain promoters, you know, like certain, you know, promoters like uh, REMG or um, uh, Jonathan Ramos comes to mind. Um, or, you know, the, the Academy presents or manifesto, um, who, you know, aren't acting, aren't sort of working out of a single venue that are kind of, because, you know, hip hop has had a hard time in venues. There was a lot of racism. There was a lot of prejudice, a lot of fear of, you know, the kind of crowds that, you know, the fear that these crowds bring in violence or work, mm-hmm. you know, or work, you know, the hip hop crowds didn't drink, you know, because venues are so driven by alcohol sales. Uh-huh. Is really hard, you know, hard, um, hard for a lot of hip hop promoters to access venues. So they're often kind of bouncing around from space to space, and or having to rent venue, rent halls to put on shows. I mean, that's sort of how. And you know, going back to the '80s, that's what it, that's what it's been like for hip hop music. So, you know, it's 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 there's definitely a lot more been a lot more barriers, and I think like hip hop, Toronto's definitely overdue. For having a dedicated hip hop venue or or a dedicated black music venue, yeah, for sure. Um, Greg and I over the past year, you know, over the years and months, uh, you know, have, have you know had these discussions on and off about venues disappearing mm-hmm. in Toronto as if it's a new phenomenon. Mm. Um, but I mean, just going through your book, it's like you know, you talked earlier about Yorkville. Um, and everyone who's in Toronto knows Yorkville as this really small block of now high-end stores or cafes, but there was 30 plus venues yeah. just in that small footprint. It's just mind blowing that there's totally that many. Mind- it's totally mind blowing. Yeah. And the, I mean, the, the Yorkville thing was kind of like getting the chance to look back on it historically and, you know, in the sort of the terms of the evolution of Toronto as a city, the Yorkville thing was really sad because it was this really vital cultural district that was completely wiped out by the city, basically on purpose. Like they wanted it gone. They wanted, they, they didn't want these grubby hippies bringing down the property values of this area of this area that was going to be great for, for the businessmen of the city, you know, yeah. like the business, the business elite wanted to open hotels and, clothing boutiques and things that were going to, you know, bring up the property values. And they viewed the coffee houses and the, of the, the hippie, the, the, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, moral panic around, you know, this was the early boomer generation. Like there, the, these teenagers who were hanging out in these places were the children of this, the sort of, you know, the, the elder generation. They were very, you know, they were really worried about their kids really scared that the kids, their kids were getting hooked on drugs and, you know, getting into this, you know, scuzzy counterculture. So they thought the, the way, the way to save their kids as well 
and as well as to, you know, make this area more profitable was to just sort of make, get rid of all these coffee houses and make it, you know, they made it harder for them to um, renew their business licenses. And they kind of invented this hippie hepatitis scare, like this basically this fake like health scare that basically emptied out the area. But then sort of in the few years after that, like Toronto became a bit more like at the political level, there was a sort of more of a reform movement, more of a, in this early seventies, there was like the, as the, as the boomers aged up and started to get into power, there was more of a interest in protecting things in the city. So you didn't really see anything like that happen again. And over the, you know, kind of like after starting in the seventies and eighties, like the kind of the Toronto, the Toronto live club scene or live music scene kind of got into a steady state equilibrium where there was kind of like, a, basically a kind of set number of clubs. Clubs would close, but new ones would open. And that kind of like lasted in a kind of equilibrium pretty much until, you know, you, where you had this sort of like core of clubs you could depend on, like the Lee's Palace and the Rivoli and the Elma Combo and Sneaky D's and uh, the Danforth and its various incarnations and Massey Hall and um, the Horseshoe, the Cameron, um, this kind of, the big bop, you know, this kind of core of, of, of established venues that were, you know, the city tolerated them. The city didn't really support them, but it didn't make their lives difficult either. Yeah. It kind of tolerated them, accepted that they were part of, oh, that nightclubs with live music is just part of the city. Yeah. Um, people go out to these clubs and they buy drinks and they buy, and they buy concert tickets and they're staying out of trouble. We're okay with that. And then in 2010 is really when things started to, started to change where kind of like then, you know, this kind of like benevolent neglect started to result in venues in more venues closing than were opening. Yeah, it's, 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 it was fascinating today. I just happened upon, um, I don't know if you follow Rick Beato on YouTube. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know who that is. Great music channel. Just phenomenal. Mm. Um, he had, he did a, a video today, the greatest singer songwriters ever. Um, and three of the top, I think 20 were Canadian, Neil Young, mm. uh, Gordon Lightfoot, mm. who was number three, according mm. to, 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 to Rick. And Joni Mitchell, number one. Hell yeah! And all three of them are out of are out of Yorkville. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so I I found I found that very timely um, to watch that video, Johnny. I, I wanted to ask you. You've uh, you've obviously uh, been a musician in mm-hmm. Toronto. I don't know if you still actively. Play, obviously not this past year, but if you, if you had still been playing uh, in bands, but. I, I really want to know if there's a venue um, that, you know, just was one of those places where you loved to play or, or maybe you, you hated to play there with a passion, <laughs> but, but for some, for some reason you talked about that ebb and flow, the venue doesn't exist anymore. You know, so this is part of our lost venues segment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious if there's a, a lost venue uh, that is close to your heart. Hmm. That's funny because, you know, some venues still exist, but maybe not in the, in, in the incarnation that I, um, that I have, uh, the strongest attachment to, mm-hmm. you know, I think like for me, um, like the two, the two places I probably loved playing the most are still around, but are, you know, are cleaned up and not like, I'm glad that they're still there but they're not, you know, they're not the scuzzy former selves that I fell in love with. And those are, that would be the main floor of the Elma combo and the basement of Drake hotel. And, um, what's funny is that the, and these are for sure for two different reasons, like the, 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 um, the basement of the Drake hotel in the early nineties, uh, was, was, like kind of the ground zero for indie music in, in the, that time period and of sort of 91. And it was only around in that sort of incarnation booked by William New from 91 to 93. And, you know, I was like 18 or 19 and only ever got to play there with my high school band when we were, you know, oh, yeah. just, just before we broke up. 
when I went away to university. But so um, my memories of playing there are very kind of like, um, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, what's the word? Like adrenaline, just memories of a lot of adrenaline, you know, just like that excitement, you know, being really young and not being that experienced and just being so excited and terrified, just pure terror of being on stage, which is just like, you know, you never, you never feel so alive of just being like, ah, how are we gonna get, I can't believe we're doing this. How are we going to get through this set? And then it's just like gone. Uh, it's, oh, it feels like so long when you're going, trying to get through the set. And then when it's over, it feels like it was five minutes. Um, but also like, getting to meet other people for the first time, getting to meet like-minded people. Like, a, you know, I, I met people that I still see like regularly, like Brennan Canning and Noah Mintz from who played in, then played in a band called Head. And Brennan went on to co-found Brooklyn Social Scene and um, Grasshopper, who was, uh, you know, who's, his name is Grasshopper. You know, I know him as Derek, but he, uh, uh, back, back to having a, a pseudonym, he was fronted a band called Grasshopper and now he runs Grasshopper Records and just, you know, see him around the corner. He lives around the corner from me, you know, and people that I still, yeah, people that I still see, like it was the first time I discovered like the sense of like having community. Like these are my people, like, like the like-minded weirdos who play in bands. Um, so, you know, and, and the Drake, you know, God bless Jeff Stober, the owner of the Drake. I'm so glad he bought that place and, fixed it up and it's still a venue or was and I'm sure it will be again, but it's, you know, to me, it'll always be the 1150. The, we, we called it the 1150 because it was, it was a, the, either the Drake or the 1150 when it was like really, you know, it was really scuzzy. It was a, you know, it was a rundown, like sort of flop house upstairs and this amazing like punk rock, um, like watering hole in the, in the basement where, um, and then the Elma combo um, that also booked by William knew who was just like, he was the guy he always booked. He always knew how to move on to like the, the place for, you know, there was a, whenever William booked a place, it was always going to be a, a friendly place for new bands. Right. And then af uh, after the, after he booked the 1150, William moved on to, well, he moved to briefly booked the Edgewater hotel, which was for short. Saw some great shows there too, and played a couple of great share shows there too. But you know, don't have as many fond memories of that place. And then he moved on to the Elma Combo, where he was, I think he booked it from 93 to 99, if memory serves. And um, the main floor of the Elmo was just a place that just actually, you know, more as a musician, it was, you know, by that point, I was more, you know, experienced and confident. And playing the Elma Combo always felt great. Like it was, the sound was always good. It was always, you know, this just the layout of the stage was the right angle. Um, you know, it was um, the sight lines were good. It wasn't too high off the, the stage wasn't too high off the ground. Um, yeah, like I said, it was always a good mix. They had a great, P, a great little house PA, and it was an easy place to fill. Like you could get thirty to fifty of your, if, you know, thirty thirty to fifty of your friends came out. It still felt like the place was full, and and it was, you know, I loved that playing that main floor of the Elmo. And it was really sad when they, when it got renovated, because I feel like they, they, they ripped the soul out of it, out of it. Mm. Bit. And the, and and I'm not talking about the, the current reno and the, the one before that, the 2001, well, 2002 reno. This wasn't the same after that. Mm. You know, there's just something about, um, you can't really, um, you can't really um, sort of, intentionally create that sort of sense of sort of, you know, scuzziness, you know, it's just sort of like, this is something that comes out of neglect that can kind of create this environment of, you know, where people don't care for some reason, it makes it easier to be yourself or something. Yeah. It has to be a place where you don't feel you, you need to like watch the walls or yeah. you don't want to scratch something. It can't be yeah. that, that pristine. I'm, I'm curious if, uh, you know, Massey Hall, when it started, had the plush sheets and it was beautiful. Yeah. But, you know, before the current renovations, I, I remember, you know, sitting on a chair that uh, that, that was broken. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think I went to see the Bare Naked Ladies there. And if I can uh, add one more space, like, yeah. the, you know, probably, you know, speaking as a musician and now as a concert presenter, the place I miss the most is Ted's Wrecking Yard, which was the original home of Wavelength, which is... Okay 
gone, gone. Like the building was demolished. There's a condo going up there on the north side, on the south side of College Street. It's sad, you know, like hopefully we'll get to be able to put up a plaque one day to memorialize Ted's. But Ted's was like the perfect small small venue. Ted's working it, you know, it was... It was still scuzzy, but it was a step up from the Elma Combo. It had a little more character. It was a little more intentional. It was like proof that you you could actually design a space. You know, I take it back. You can actually design a space <laughs> to have that. You know, to have that vibe. You know, to have that sort of unpretentious vibe of where you can be yourself and feel like you don't have to put on any airs or impress anybody. You know, and um, and it was very simple. It was very you know. Ted was an architect. There is a Ted. Ted Footman. He's an architect. And, you know, he, you know, he, the bar was a slab of uh, igneous rock, you know, and the, um, and the slab, like a, a slab of stone and there was tire tracks painted on the walls and there was just, you know, the tables just had, had candles on them. And it was like, um, there was only one bathroom. <laughs> you know, was, the other one was always broken. Wow. And it was kind of a, it was kind of a dump, but it was also sort of like an intentionally, sort of curated dump and um, everyone loved Ted's. Everyone loved playing there. It also, I think they actually moved the same, the PA from, if memory serves, they maybe even moved the PA that I loved from Elmo to Ted's. Um, like Ted's, when, when, when Yvonne Massell started booking Ted's in 1998, it definitely stole a lot of the thunder from the main floor of the Elmo. Like a lot of people sort of moved, smaller bands have moved, moved over from there. Because the Elmo had been the kind of hot spot for three years, and then Ted sort yeah. of became the t- the hot spot after it. Was well, so which neighborhood was Ted's in? So Ted's wrecking yard was in Little Italy. So That's it was right. basically at College and Euclid. So like across for or yeah, like um, if you know where Soundscapes is. Yes. It's basically it's just across the street and over a bit from from Soundscapes. Okay, yeah, I used to work at the uh, Scotia Bank at College and Grace. Yeah, close to there. Yeah, so, yeah and some people get it confused with Ted's Collision, which is still there and is just a bar. Was actually, which it actually is only called Collision because Ted sold the bar years ago. But oh, people okay. still kept calling it Ted's, just out of sort of sure. urban, urban London, you know, out of out of um, out of habit. Then yeah, Coll- yeah. Ted's Collision or Collision was just a was just a bar. Um, I think they, you know, occasionally they'd have, might have a band in the back, but it was more like just like a, a place where you go for beers and, uh, and Oh, Ted, Ted opened collision first, like a few years before he opened the wrecking yard and the wrecking yard. It was amazing. It was, everyone loved, everyone loved playing. Sorry, I'm repeating myself, but it, it had like the best sit, sight lines the best sound for a room of its size it had these sort of nicks and crannies where Especially had this great little space in the back behind, like, or I guess the front, like on looking over the street next to the bar. We even did little uh, wavelength art installations in there, or art shows in there. Um, like the Broken Social Scene guys got their start there. And we all still talk about how amazing Ted's was. Was, was um, fantastic. And, and so I, I feel like nothing's, you know, obviously, you know, you as generationally, generationally, you get attached to spaces, right? And like, that's right. Um, but I feel like, you know, in the last 20 years, I don't feel like I've seen a venue that had quite the same magic as that space. Some of the others have come close, but um, and every generation, I guess every generation has their Ted's wrecking yard. But. Yes, that is so true. Uh, Johnny, this has been awesome. Before I let you go. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Certainly. Um, we like to ask all our guests uh, at this point. What are you currently listening to these days? Hmm. Well, I listen to Wavelength's regularly curated playlist released in isolation. I know it sounds like a self a self promo, but you know it's actually like how I keep up to date with all um, the current music. Is uh, all of us that are involved in Wavelength, we every week we throw add new tracks to this this playlist on Spotify. Okay. So it's you know stuff that will will come up for that you know you know, will come up in my release rela- release radar or things that, you know, new releases will see, you know, put plugged on Exclaim or artists putting their own pages together. But, you know, like it's all, it's always been, you know, friend, friend recommendations. Someone just, um, just told me about this amazing 
indigenous musician based in Montreal called Kizzy's. It's like K I Z I S, who just released like a four hour long album with wow. like, you know, guest appearances by Owen Pallett and Beverly Glenn Copeland. And this artist like doesn't even have a website or a Facebook page. They just have an Instagram and they've been reviewed on Pitchfork. And wow, it's, it's kind of crazy how things work nowadays. And yeah, the music's, the music's kind of hard. It's a little electro pop, a little like art folk, very kind of in- uncategorizable from a, sort of like a, I think a, a not a trans not, I guess, maybe, t- maybe I think two-spirited indigenous artist um, called, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Kizis, Kizis, I think. You know, it's just, there's there's so much good music being made right now. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's constant that you can just discover an amazing new artist every day, pretty much. So awesome. So yeah, listen to Release in Isolation and keep up with all the latest stuff that the Wavelength uh, Brain Trust are listening to over here. That is awesome. The book yes. is Any Night of the Week, A DIY History of Toronto Music, 1957 to 2001. If, uh, if you're a music fan, uh, if you're a history fan of Toronto, um, if you want a, a list of all of the venues from 57 <laughs> to 2001 that were in Toronto, um, there's probably at least 200 venues by name. That probably. Are- that are listed, yeah. book, if not more. I actually haven't counted how many are listed in there, but you're probably right. Yeah, and I th- I think that's another book. Whether you write it, or yeah. whether you're, you you publish it or, or edit it, there needs to be a venue book, uh, a music venue book that does not include library rooms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, as as much as I'm all for artists finding places to play, um, you know, I'm more interested in in sort of those those grimy rooms, whether they're manufactured like Ted's Reckon Yard um, or whether they're just grimy places like the, like the old basement. The old basement the of the Drake Hotel. Yeah. The, Drake, the real Drake Underground. No disrespect to the current Drake Underground. Yeah, that's too fancy. Yeah. But no, this a great <laughs> book, Johnny. Thank you so much for writing this. Uh, I, I, uh, I've enjoyed reading it uh, so far and I'm going to enjoy reading the rest for sure. Thanks, Kareem. It was great to chat with you. Thanks for thanks for having me on the show. This has been a blast, and um, I am holding you to coming on again. Yeah. Uh, so we because I know Greg wants to talk about Queen Street West and the evolution of of, of all those venues and the music, and uh, there's just so much to talk about. But again, thank you, Johnny, for spending time with us today. You're welcome, and let's do it. Hopefully, this summer we can gather in person for that second chat. Absolutely.